I like the music, and I like being back in Ohio. So thank you very much. Um, it's good to be here. Been excited to come back. It's been a long time since I've had a chance to come back since I went to uh, law school here, so it's just a, a thrill to be back in town. And I think uh, Cleveland's just such a great town, so get out and enjoy it. Um, so thank you for having me here. I'm going to talk to you about a few things today. One, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, or ODNI. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my shop, the Cyber Threat Intelligence Integration Center, CTIC as we call it. I'm going to tell you a little bit about how the U.S. government works, uh, not just in the United States, but also a little bit touch on our, our global efforts to combat the cyber threat. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what all of us need to do together to keep our shared internet space secure. So first, the ODNI. The ODNI was created right after 9-11 uh, and the, as a result of the Patriot Act. Why? Because we knew in government we, we did a pretty good job individually within each of the individual agencies and components, but we didn't necessarily do the best job that we could do working across. So the Office of the Director of National Intelligence was created so that there was an overlay across the intelligence community, so there was a centralized place where all the different agencies <coughs> could feed up into. The, the DNI, or the Director of National Intelligence, is the <coughs> sorry, Principal Intelligence Advisor to the President. He also administers a national intelligence budget of over $50 billion so that we can get things done in the community. It's very, very hard. You might have CIA, NSA, and all the other agencies trying to do things individually, but if we really want to move the ball forward together, the ODNI has a way to do that through a budget process. So they're there to really harmonize the uh, other agencies. And I say that because that was in the counterterrorism world. I think there's a lot that we learn when we think about the counterterrorism world that applies to the cyber world today. Things happened you know, around the 9-11 timeframe that we hadn't really thought of or envisioned. We really looked at ourselves as a country. We had to evaluate how we were doing, and we recognized there were ways that we could do better. I think that's pretty similar to the times we're in right now. I think we're in a time where we're facing things we haven't really faced before. Things are being used against us in ways that we hadn't contemplated before, and it's time for us to take a critical look at ourselves, not just in government, but private industry and across America, and say, how can we improve? Where do we need to change? What do we need to do differently to be better? The ODNI has four centers, mission centers. One is for counterterrorism. It was among the first. One is for national uh, security and counterintelligence. One is for um, counterproliferation. And then my shop, which is for cyber. In CTIC, our mission is to build an understanding of cyber threats to the national security interests. And our role is really to inform high-level decision-making. So you and the public won't really see CTIC, but you really won't see a lot of that. You won't see a, a, a product that we produce or analysis that we send out. It's really for internal uh, government use, and we primarily serve for the president and the national security advisors as well. But what else is going on in the cyber world across government? Well, there are a lot of different agencies that have a role and responsibility. So there's a presidential directive that helped to organize the different lines of effort. And that presidential director's directive said, okay, FBI, you're in charge of the threat response. So we have a significant cyber event, you roll out and you pursue the threat. DHS, you have an asset response lead. So that means mitigation, it means cleanup, it means coming out and providing assistance before and after a breach, trying to either prevent it or help cleaning up after it. CTIC, you have an intelligence integration role because we need a place for all the intel to come together into one place, make sense of it, provide context, and feed that into decision-making at the highest levels of government. And we sit where we sit, we're pretty uniquely positioned to do that. And let, let me uh, tell you a little bit about what's occurred in the past to say why we came about, how we came about, and, and tell you about how we've tried to make a difference. So Sony Pictures uh, attack, I'm sure most of you remember that. Let's break it down into what it was. Okay, it was a hostile nation state that attacked a U.S. company on U.S. soil, employing our U.S. citizens for their exercise of their First Amendment constitutionally protected right to make movies. 
It just happened to be a movie that North Korea didn't like. So when a nation state is attacking a US citizen, US person, US company on US soil, that's gonna get the attention of the White House. And it's gonna get the attention of government. And it should, you want it to, right? This isn't just some kid in a basement, right? This is an, all that is behind a nation state actor putting all of its resources and its nation, national power against one of our citizens here. But there wasn't a CTIC in place right then and government did a good job. We did a great job. I'm, I'm FBI, I'm still FBI, I'm still an FBI agent. I just happen to be detailed to the ODNI. The FBI rolled out just the way they do and, and they sat side by side with Sony Pictures for months working to make sure that every aspect of that was handled in the best way possible to get the best result possible. But let's make this uh, a little analogy here, just for fun. So if you don't have a, somebody leading the orchestra, right, you have all these different sections. So let's call the FBI the winds, the wind instruments. So something like Sony Pictures happens, they call the FBI, and what happens? Well, they get their instruments out, and they start to warm up. And they might be tuning their instrument, and they're warming their instrument up, and they might do, be doing their scales, and they might be getting out some sheet music, trying to figure out what they're going to play. What does all that translate into? Well, they're going to the victim location, they're collecting evidence, they might be issuing process, they might be getting a FISA, they might be working with the victims in various ways. They might be trying to mitigate the threat. They might be trying to get attribution, all the things they do. And in the midst of that, what are they doing? Well, they're gonna reach out to their other partners. Hey, NSA, let's call them the strings. Do you know anything about this attack? It seems to be coming from overseas because in the beginning, right, you have an attack, but you don't know who's behind it. For all you know, at that very moment, it could be the kid in the basement somewhere. So you're not really sure where it's coming from or who's behind it when you first roll out. So FBI calls NSA, hey, hey strings, time to warm up. We're gonna have a performance here, we need your help. Do you know anything? So they're gonna look in their collection. They're gonna see what they have. They're gonna see if they can figure out whether or not they can determine the origin of this attack that hit Sony Pictures. So the strings are warming up now. Now they're getting their instrument out and they're tuning up and they're doing their scales but by now, FBI's already been on the scene for quite some time. They've already been doing their performance for a while. So they're at different stages of readiness. They're at different stages in the game. FBI calls CIA. Hey, CIA, do you know anything about this? We've got this attack on Sony Pictures. What do you know? Let's call them the brass. Well, now the brass is gonna get their instruments and they're gonna start warming up, right? Same thing, warm up their instruments, start doing their scales, start seeing what song they might play. Well, we have the winds over here they're already playing music, maybe even in unison with one another. Then we've got our strings. Our strings might still be playing scales, might still be just warming up. We've got our brass who's just getting their instrument out of the case. And there's nobody really orchestrating all of these efforts. So what happened is the White House wanted the information as fast as possible to say, are we doing everything we can possibly do to combat this threat? Do we need to be doing more? Is there something we should be doing from a US government perspective, from a partner perspective, from a diplomatic perspective? They're asking all these questions, but they, it was very challenging for them to get a comprehensive answer of what was happening at the time. So they said, we could do better. We need an overlay. And because the ODNI was created to be an overlay for counter, it, and again, it sort of had its genesis in terrorism, it made a lot of sense for it to be the overlay for, for cyber. So they created the Cyber Center, and that's, that's how we came into being. So now let's contrast that situation with the WannaCry. Okay, y'all remember the WannaCry, right? Over 200,000 computers in over 150 countries were affected. Again, the top levels of leadership in government were asking, what do we do? What's happening? What does this mean? Why are some victims affected, but yet we have other companies very similar to them, but they're not affected? Why are some countries so affected and other countries less affected? How do we get answers to that? Where's the single focal point for me to begin getting those answers? They were able to come to CTIC, CTIC worked across government because we're a joint duty assignee organization. 
That means working for me, I have FBI, CIA, NSA, DIA, I have a whole host perk, I have all kinds of different agencies represented. I'm tiny, my agency is about 40 people, but we, we are well represented and we, our job is to make sure that we have all of those different connections across government so we can get those answers as well as get the integrated threat intelligence picture as quickly as possible for decision making. So that's how we filled that role and tried to make improvements. So what does the cyber threat landscape look like from a US government perspective? I'm gonna hit the highlights. This is um, probably a gross um, overgeneralization, if you will, but I think it helps us try to think about the problem set if we think about it in these terms. So one, we've got China still absolutely focused on anything that gives them an economic or military advantage. Russia, still looking at political targets and influencing national events. Now you came here to educate yourselves. And I'm gonna share with you a little bit about how government thinks about the difference between influence and interference. So that when you listen to the news and you hear those terms used one way by say newscasters and maybe, or commentators or whoever it might be, and, and you hear those terms used other ways by government officials, you will be able to make sense of it. Influence, influence has been happening since the beginning of time. Nation states seek to influence other nation states to their advantage. And they do that in many, 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 many ways. They do that through media. They do that through getting people to meet with leaders. They do that with trying to get, just even with the general population and citizenry. They've been trying to influence for, forever. But with the power of social media now, they're able to do it at scale. So influence is trying to change the hearts and minds influences messaging in a certain way to get you to do something that's in their interest. Now you don't really know who all is behind each of those social media personas. And I'm telling you we have every reason to believe that you can't trust all social media personas. So now that, that's what we're talking about when we say influence. Does Russia seek to influence elections? Absolutely. Interference. When we in the government talk about interference, we're talking about did they get into a system in some electronic way and change votes? Did they change a vote such that the vote you cast looks different than the way you cast it when it was counted? That's an interference. Have we seen the interference affect elections? We have not. And you've heard the, director of, the former uh, director of national intelligence talk about that. And we're doing everything in our power in government to try to keep that from happening. It's very important uh, to the integrity of our elections and our government. But so is influence. I mean, there, I wanna make sure that it, you understand both are problematic, right? So it really takes a lot of discipline on the part of the U of US citizens to make sure that we understand what's happening in our world to understand what's being used against us in this world, how it's being used against us in this world so that we can be smart about how we combat it. North Korea um, basically goes after anything that they perceive as potentially causing reputational damage. And then they also have, uh, they do a lot for financial gain as well. Iran, pretty much all the above. Very, very, very active in almost every space. They may not necessarily be as sophisticated in everything they do and the way they do it, not may, maybe not as, as much so as Russia or China, but absolutely active enough to be effective toward furthering their own goals. So what else concerns me? So we've talked about some of the big nation state actors, but there comes a point in time when what's happening here domestically, even if it's criminal in nature, even if it's unattributed publicly in nature, um, that it causes a national security concern for us. And that's when we cannot perform our essential functions. And we've seen that, and, and we also have to remember that 80% of our critical infrastructure is in the hands of the private sector. So you don't necessarily have this barrier or this physic physical location that the US government can easily protect, right? It's different than a border. It's different than something that's very well defined. So you have all these different ways in which we're affected. And here's some of them. It's some of the ways we've been affected just in the last 18 months to two years or so. We had SamSam -Sam ransomware hit over 200 victims. 
hospitals, healthcare industry, ports, the emergency services, Ryuk ransomware hit Water and Sewer Authority in North Carolina. Dharma ransomware hit hospitals in Texas. Emotet malware hit elect electricity and natural gas provider. We had in May cyber actors targeting US industrial equipment company with Ryuk. We had the Robin Hood ransomware attack against the city of Baltimore, which I think probably everyone here is familiar with just by reading the news. We had a coordinated ransomware attack against 22 mu municipalities in Texas. It affected their ability to issue payments to their citizens, issue birth certificates, and issue death certificates. And anyone in here who's ever had a birth or death in the family knows the significance of getting those certificates in a pretty timely manner. Cloud environment. I recently spoke at a cloud uh, expo. And just very, very briefly, some things are unique to cloud, some things are not, just uh, depending on the, the nature of the way it's set up. But we had the meltdown inspector exploits which hit different technologies. It hit the personal computers, mobile devices, as well as the cloud services. But in that environment, it's just important to think about the fact that they're targeting data stored in the process memory. So that stays there over time as different people use those services. Same thing with the cloud-born exploit discovered in February. It allowed attackers to implant persistent backdoors and firmware of bare metal servers. So you have this whole nation right now that's using infrastructure as a service. And we do have some vulnerabilities there because if you have persistent access in that firmware, then as different customers come in and out, that vulnerability still exists, which could affect multiple customers going in and out of those services. So it's just a different environment and a different way of thinking about how we have to look at our problem set. And I know those of you who are in this uh, cloud environment yourselves as a technology um, uh, service, you know this. But what I'm trying to do is raise awareness for everyone. My goal today, is, and my goal in general when I go out and speak, is to just raise awareness about all the different kinds of problem sets that are out there so we know more about the nature of the world we live in today. So it's really about trying to sensitize and then talk a little more about it. So what's the US government doing? Well, we have a national cyber strategy. It has four pillars. The US government is united under the cyber strategy. Number one, protect the American people. Number one priority. Number two, promote American prosperity. So for those in the private sector, that should be pretty good news. And it's good news for all of us, but I think sometimes we pit ourselves against each other for reasons that don't necessarily make sense to me. Our goals are the same there. The government and private sector are both trying to promote American prosperity. It's one of our pillars. Three, preserve peace through strength. I'm gonna pause on that one. Because I don't care what craziness you hear out there, and I don't care how anybody makes anything sound, it is not the goal of the government to get engaged in armed conflict. The goal of government is preserving peace. We do that through strength. And we have a phenomenal military, one of the I'm so proud of our military. I want us to be the strongest and best in the world. And I want us to rely upon them and know that they're there for us when we need them. And they are preparing every day to be there when we need them. And for anyone here who's served, thank you for your service. But the military will tell you, it is absolutely our goal to use them as a last resort. We are all about coming up with ways and strategies and approaches intended to preserve peace. I want you to know that about your government. Four, advance the American influence. What does that mean? It means that we want to get as many countries as possible together, to be like-minded in trying to make our shared internet safe space safe. That's the goal, because it is shared space. And we're all using it, and we're all interconnected. And if there are countries out there that aren't safe, that impacts us. That makes us vulnerable. So what are the different ways that we go about trying to make this space safe and react? And what are the different ways that we've carried out the strategy? Some of it is attribution. Attribution plays a role, whether it's public or private. So sometimes you'll hear public attribution of a certain event in the news, and sometimes you won't. 
It doesn't mean that your government's not doing something about it, it just means it's not a public attribution at the time. Why do we do that? We want to shed light on the activity, right? It's part of our government policy. It demonstrates that we're acting on behalf of a victim. It demonstrates solidarity, and it's able to bring out activity that we say, not appropriate, not okay. There's nation state activity against nation state activity. Again, that goes back a long, long time. There are rules of engagement for military activity against military activity. That's been in place for a long time. But this idea of nation state activity against individuals, we want to draw a line there. We want to be clear. We want it to stop. We have all sorts of tools in the toolbox to do that. Diplomatic efforts, intelligence actions, economic actions that we can take, financial actions we can take, law enforcement actions we can take. But we want to make sure that they're designed to demonstrate our strength in a way that preserves peace. So the Department of Justice issued at least one criminal indictment against each of the big four. There were two Chinese APT-10 MSS actors, uh, uh, Ministry of State Security actors, for their theft of intellectual property and business information. China used business information to hurt U.S. companies. We can, we've absolutely seen that. So there have been occasions, whether this, it was this one or another, I'm sorry, I just don't remember, in which China takes this business information and they're able to underbid because they had all the information they needed to underbid U.S. companies. Russia, GRU, um, Russia's main military intelligence directorate, there have been indictments against them for influence and disinformation operations. North Korea, one guy, Park Jin Hook. You heard me mention WannaCry, you heard me mention Sony Pictures. Same guy, one guy. Guess what else he did? He was also behind the Bank of Bla Bangladesh where he maliciously caused the illegal transfer of funds to, to the tune of about $81 million. Now, if you're North Korea and you've got one guy who can do all that, that's not bad. But it should wake us up in this country to say, well, what's going on? Iran. We've had a number of indictments, various indictments against Iran. Uh, one of them involved nine IRGC, Islamic Republic Guard Corps, their military, under the name of MABNA, steal 31 terabytes of academic research and intellectual property. This one was kind of fascinating to me. I worked on it, and when we tried to go out and talk to the universities, I understand there's some university presence here, uh, we talked to universities, and at first the universities were like, well, research is meant to be shared. We want the research out there. We want people to know. We want people to have the information. That's how globally we're going to get better. But what did Iran do? They didn't get it the way everybody else had to get it. They stole it. And it cost money to get access to the research. The US government didn't want to necessarily go through the trouble it could take to put a value on the research itself. It's kind of hard to put a value on research. How much did that cost? So instead, what we did in this particular case, we said, what did it cost to get access to the research? Because there was a fee that's neat and easy and clean. That means the harm of this case is much greater than the dollar amount I'm going to share with you. But just the dollar amount of what it cost to access the information saved Iran, cost those here $3.4 billion. Now, humor me a little. I went on the internet, found a few things on the internet, so it must be true. I found out, according to the internet, that $3.4 billion buys two US Navy advanced destroyer ships. $3.4 billion can buy five US Navy fighter and attack jets. $3.5 billion runs the city of Seattle's public safety sector. That includes their fire, police services, emergency services, for five years. $3.4 billion is more than the gross domestic product of over 30 countries. 
Do you care now? Can I get you to care now? It's a big deal. That's one case, one campaign, nine guys in Iran. They're not the only nine, and this wasn't the only campaign. So there's a lot of harm out there. There's a lot going on out there. And some of you might say, well, indictments, what good is that? These guys are sitting in Iran. Who? You're not going to arrest them. What impact does that have? Yeah, bravo, US government. You're never going to get them behind bars, right? Well, here's the impact it has. And here's the impact we hope it has. And here's what we're driving toward. Preserve peace through strength. What does it do? Number one, it demonstrates our strength. It demonstrates the ability of the US government to say, I know you stole academic research. I'm able to tell you where you stole it from. I'm able to trace it all the way back to you in Iran, not just in Iran, but to a company you call Mabna. And oh, by the way, I happen to know that behind Mabna is the IRGC, working at the direction of the Iranian government on behalf of their military. And I know the nine guys behind the keyboard who did it. And I don't care if I ever put them in a US prison, that has value. It sends a message. It demonstrates our strength. But it's not the only thing we do. We don't just put the indictment out there and that's it sometimes. Oftentimes we use the whole host of tools that I've talked about earlier. So let's talk about this a little bit more. You have an event, a bad event. And then sometimes you have a public attribution of, hey, North Korea was behind it, hey, Iran was behind it. But there's all this time in between. And it would be very easy for people who don't understand government to say, yeah, no kidding, where you been, right? The private sector told us who was behind that the second day after it happened. Good job, government. But let me help you understand what's happening behind the scenes before that public announcement. There's a lot. So number one, yeah, it's great that the private sector can get out there and tell you who's behind that and can tell you a lot about it right away. I love they can do that. I, I think it's awesome. But the US government has to work a little differently. We have to vet it a little differently. We have to be right because a lot of policy decisions and a lot of actions will be taken as a result of our decision of who was responsible. So we're gonna really take our time on that one and make sure we get it right. We're gonna make sure there's a lot of conversation across the different communities to make sure we get it right. We're also using the diplomatic efforts I talked about. Sometimes those are private messaging. Sometimes they're diplomatic efforts across the globe having to do with, hey, we're gonna go after or take an action against Iran for the bad things they just did. Let's get some of our global partners to work with us. As we did that, we discover they too have victims. It's happened many, many times. We go to different countries, we tell them what we're learning, what we found, they say, gosh, we have that too. Sometimes we're the ones taking it to them and telling them, hey, did you know that you have victims just like we do? Can we work together on this? There's a lot of diplomatic effort going on there, a lot of investigative effort going on there at a global level. Sometimes we get other countries to message with us. Sometimes they message on their own just because it's part of their national policy to do so. What else is happening? Equities checks. Right, we have to make sure that before we take an action, particularly a public action, that we've gone through all the equities checks that are necessary to make sure that we're not going to jeopardize an ongoing activity. Could be FBI, CIA, NSA, could be our foreign partners, could be anybody. So we wanna make sure that we've had time to work that out so that they can take whatever action they need to take to be able to continue their activity differently and adjust to the action that we're gonna take publicly. We're working with victims in that time frame. We're working towards solutions to the problem in that time frame. So for example, oftentimes there's a vulnerability, it's been exploited, it's causing harm, and we wanna make sure that we get that patched or we get something out there to solve the problem before we go public with it. That's happening quietly behind the scenes. Sometimes US government can help in that effort. Sometimes it's just a matter of going to the private sector and saying, hey, there's a problem we discovered. Can you guys work on this? Because we don't wanna go public until you guys get a fix. Sometimes there are human 
sources, human, humans who are helping us, who are placed in particular places, and we would put them in harm's way if we didn't handle that situation appropriately before going public. There's all these things that are happening. We're, we're also providing enough information for sanctions and getting those in order. We're getting enough information for designations. IRGC has been designated as a terrorist organization now. So we're saying all of that's happening so that when we come out publicly, it's orchestrated. We're on the same sheet of music. We've all warmed up together. We've all tuned up together. And we're playing on the same sheet of music when we go public. Or we're playing on the same sheet of music for any of those private actions that I've talked about too. And that's what's happening in that time frame. Your role. Thrilled to have you here because it means you really are interested in educating yourself and making a difference. I'm gonna ask you to step into the role of trying to change culture in America. I think we have to really think about how can we do that? What is our responsibility here? And how can we be effective together? How many of you are, are technicians in some way, right? You guys are out there, you're trying to put things together, you're trying to make things work, and oftentimes somebody comes to you and says, I need X. And they may even give you parameters or a really tight time frame to get that done. So you're trying to do X, right? Leaders, how many of you are leaders out there? Think about it this way too. Leaders, you get out there and you say, I'm leading, I want X. And I want it in this time frame and I want it this way so that I can do things. That's enabling. Enabling in certain circumstances is not always a good thing. We've enabled action over the course of time in technology. But now I'm gonna ask you to do it more responsibly by adding one word to your vocabulary. Securely. So now, leaders, lead by example. Ask your people to do things. Say, how can I do X securely? What would it take to do X securely? Technicians, you're asked to do something. Okay, boss, let me look at that. Let me see how we can do that securely. Let me get back to you and tell you what it would take to do it securely. Did that one word change your frame of mind just a little bit? I think, I think we can do that together. That's a simple step that we can all take. Customer experience, customer expectations, how many times have we heard we can't do something securely because of customer expectations or, or tolerance? Did you ever think there'd come a day when we would be completely tolerant of taking off our shoes at the airport and stripping down to almost nothing? I think our tolerance level is pretty good. If we can understand it, will make us safer. I, I don't necessarily always buy that the customers won't tolerate something. I where I'm trying to go in this talk and others and with you and asking you to spread the word is I think we're in a point where our expectations need to be higher. What am I asking of you? Share the intel picture that you have. And we often hear that there are obstacles to that. What obstacles? Legal. How many of you have said, general counsel won't let me share, I really wanna share, but as soon as the lawyers get involved, we can't do it. I see you laughing. Makes me feel good. I've definitely hit on the right note here. I have homework for you. Here's your homework. Ask them to sit next to you and show them on your screen with all the fancy cyber stuff you do, what it looks like, what malware looks like, what it looks like to sequester it, what it looks like when you're gonna copy it and what it's gonna look like when you wanna give a copy of that to the FBI or to DHS and share it. Show them it's not email content. Show them it's not regulatory information, right? Because they're doing their job. And until they see it and understand it to the fullest extent, they're going to do their job in the way, best way that they know how. But you're here to educate yourself today. I'm gonna to ask you to educate others when you go back. 
Downtime. We hear that as an obstacle. I can't share, I can't collect, I can't do all this stuff because I can't, I can't update, I can't patch, I can't do this, I can't do that because I can't afford the downtime. Does that resonate with anybody? It's a tough thing, right? I'm going to offer you a few thoughts on that. One, the city of Baltimore, I'm sure, cannot afford $18 million on the cleanup right now for what was probably preventable with some pretty simple steps. I am not here to re-victimize the city of Baltimore at all. I fully understand why they were in the position they're in. What I'm saying is we have to have that bigger, broader understanding at that higher level. We have to get that thought process to the decision makers so that we can start to come together better. Here's the other thought I said I'd share too. Here's the other one on that. The financial sector has decided that they're going to leverage one another. They're going to come together and work together so that maybe one of them can cover transactions for the other while the other one goes down and takes care of patching or updates or whatever, or if somebody has some catastrophic failure, another one's going to step in. Financial sector has decided to come together as a sector and really work as best as they can, most effectively as they can, to protect one another so that we can carry on our financial security. Who are your partners? That was by pure innovative thinking. I'm going to ask you for some innovative thinking. If you think you can't operate securely because you can't afford the downtime, do you have partners? Are there other ways to solve the problem besides what's happening in your four walls? We have got to get creative. And those who are getting creative are actually doing pretty well. We're starting to see some of those practices enter other sectors. Securing the human. You know, God help us on this one. <laughs> I know that it is easy to think that there's a lot of sophisticated activity happening out there that we just can't protect against. And it's just all this crazy cyber stuff. But still, 80 to 90% of what we see had some form of human error behind it. Because people just can't stop clicking. Oh, my God. Right? You got to see the dancing bear. Can't help yourselves. I don't know what to tell you on that one. This is there. I, I do think there's some room here for us to really grow. And I think, again, it goes back to that educational piece. It, if people don't understand that clicking on dancing bears can hurt their systems, I, they need to. I believe it's going to start young. Do we have, I think we have, there may be eighth graders here or a, cl a young class here. Is there a young class here? Yes, I hear a yes. Smart kids. You know now not to click on the dancing bears. And tell all your friends. No, but seriously, what, you're, what you are here today doing, I think, is a fantastic step in the right direction. Because if we don't start to educate the young people on the harm that's involved in, da in daily activity, quite frankly, we will never get past the human factor, the human error piece of it. Now, I'm not saying that 80% was all clicking. Some of that is misconfiguration of systems. Some of that was failure to patch. Some of that was just... Not, not doing some of the basics I put behind the human error, but it's still a big factor. So we have to get past that. And we have to look at better ways to automate that. And you guys are smart here, and I'm going to get into this in just a minute now. So what does the future look like? When I think about the future, I'm going to share a little bit about the past to help frame our thoughts. When I was growing up, we didn't have locks on our doors. I mean, with a little skeleton key lock, maybe, but nobody ever knew where that thing was. And I'm sure it would not have kept anybody out who was determined to come in. I lived in small towns, relatively safe. We lived a certain way. We had a certain way of life. Think about that, way of life. It was safe. It was secure. We didn't lock our doors. I had an aunt who lived in a big city who became fearful of what was happening in America because home invasions started to occur. Theft started to occur. People were starting to be threatened in their own homes. So she sent a friend in my small town to put a deadbolt on my door. And now look at us. And just in my lifetime, what do we have now? How have we evolved? We have home security as an industry now. Look how we've changed. It's not just a deadbolt. You have entire home security systems. 
You can get buzzers and alarms. You can see everything from your phone. You can have people call you. You have people call the police or fire. A whole industry arose to keep us safer in our homes. What else? Seatbelts. When I grew up, cars didn't have seatbelts. We just hopped in the car with our pillow and blanket, and we talked, and we laughed, and we played games, and we fought with our brother or sister, and mom and dad drove across the highway. What happened? More cars came on the highways. Additional travel caused more collisions. People were getting hurt. But we weren't ready to give up our way of life, our way of life again. Instead, there was some government intervention that happened. And the government said, cars must have seatbelts. And the auto industry could have said, all right, seatbelts, got it, must have. Here's your seatbelts, done. All cars now have seatbelts, we're good, compliant. But they didn't respond from a standpoint of compliance. They responded from values and our way of life of saying, we want to really keep people safe here. We really want to protect people. So what did they do? They invested millions of dollars in research and development. And they figured out crumple zones, right? And they figured out airbags and cameras and alarms. And now those things drive themselves and stop for you. And did it become so expensive? Like everybody said, oh, we can't afford to do that. Customers won't tolerate that price point. No. Every one of us has a car with some sort of safety feature. That's what it became, safety feature. Those words, those terms, those actions changed American culture to protect our way of life. That's what I'm asking from this audience today. Do your part to change our culture so that we can protect our way of life and reevaluate what we're being told and thinking about what our tolerance levels really are. Last few thoughts, I know I'm out of time, I, if you can indulge me for a moment, especially because we have young people here. I really want to uh, touch on something. Why are issues like Chinese companies bringing in Huawei to be the world's 5G service provider a concern? And why would some, something like Kaspersky, a Russian company, being a software security service be of concern? Right? Why would that be a concern? Because after all, they're cheaper. Shouldn't we get the best price? I'm here to tell you that there's a financial cost and there's a freedom cost. We have to think in terms of freedom costs. I recently spoke to a group of current and former military members and I told them no one knows the cost of freedom more than the people in that room. I'm here to tell you today that we have to think about freedom costs because China, Russia have laws, right? You don't have to be in government to know the super secret stuff to know what's going on. Just look at their laws. Their laws say that anything that transits their country on their systems is subject to their laws and their laws allow for monitoring that we don't allow for in the United States and their laws allow, require, sharing of data and information and intelligence with their government. So if you want your information to go to China and Russia and be used in ways that we know they're going to use against us, we've seen that competitively, we've seen that in influence, we've seen that in all the ways I've talked to you about today. You don't have to look far to know that their interests are different than ours or to know that they act in ways that are different than the way we act. That's why those issues are big issues for us. And that's why I'm asking you to think, not just in terms of the financial cost, but in terms of the freedom cost. So with that, I wanna ask for you to do your part. We'll continue doing our part in government. And I think that this is the most important message of all. We have to do it together. So if there's anything that you need to bring to the attention, because there's no internet police, you're gonna know it first based on where you work, where you sit, where you see things, you will see it first. Bring it to the attention of someone in government, FBI, DHS, 
A call to one is a call to all. They're shared appropriately. You don't need to figure it out because we have to come together to protect our way of life. Thank you.